As a business owner, I have to educate myself. I'm currently educating myself to understand finances and things like that. It's important. We have to know our numbers. However, it's not my strong suit. So I have to trust the person that I hire to do that kind of from start, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just checking numbers and I can only follow behind them as much as I can because I can't tell them how to do the job. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fuck Your Podcast. I'm Emma Pardo. And I'm Katie Martin. And we're excited today to bring on one of our favorite people. Today on the podcast is one of our favorite people, Mr. John Gilliland in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, owner of Stalwart General Contractors and Stalwart Roofing. So we're excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So we're just going to jump right in here. So most people don't know that we, we all work together. So this could be super, super fun, casual conversation. But really, um, first, just to have our audience get up to speed, we have a decent size audience in the roofing industry, but then also just general entrepreneurs. So just give us a little bit of background. Tell the, tell the listener your story of where you started and what got you to where you're at right now. Well, uh, the career wise, I started early, 15 years old, basically, right? And uh, started the construction industry. I never had another job, never flipped burgers, never did anything else. It was construction all the way through. Um, I've held I've held positions in pretty much all the trades, the major trades anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I, I worked through the ranks, started commercial, then I went into industrial, back to commercial. And then uh, about two years ago, well, no, three years ago, the uh, Hurricane Laura hit Louisiana, and that's when I was introduced to roofing, uh, insurance restoration roofing. Mm -hmm. I've always been around commercial industrial roofing, but when it comes to insurance work, that's when I was introduced to it. And I already had the company started, the general contracting company, and I saw an opportunity to merge the two industries as best practices. Um, and so I started doing that. And so this has been our first full year coming to a close um, of strictly roofing. Well, it's general contracting and roofing, but yep. a majority roofing focus. Awesome. I was going to say, so Katie and I visited not that long, literally a month ago. <laughs> did. Right. Um, and that was the first time I've ever been to Louisiana. Me that too. Was exciting. I was, what's so funny, and this is a side note, irrelevant to business, but I've always wanted to try gumbo and like anywhere. I'm not going to try gumbo in Missouri or gumbo in Texas. Right. No, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> and I got to have it one of the days for lunch. And we walked out. What's that place down the street from you? What's that? Rocco's. Yes. And I tried gumbo and it was fantastic. So that's exciting. Yeah. If you guys are ever in Louisiana, gumbo at, in Louisiana is where it's at. Yeah. But well, side note on gumbo, everyone makes it different. I know. So, that's yeah. why I wanted to try a Louisiana style gumbo because it's but even here. Everyone makes it different. That's crazy. Yeah. I just got into a debate with my brother about gumbo because we both cook. And I said, the next time we go camping, I said, I found a really good recipe. I'd want to make gumbo because it's enough food to feed everybody when we all go on a big trip. He's like, well, what is he's like, I hear him like ask his wife. He goes, what is it that I make? He goes, well, I make jambalaya. And I go, isn't just jambalaya the leftover gumbo and rice? Like, isn't that basically what it is? Basically. Mm, kinda, but yeah. I make box jambalaya. I make oh, no. what, whatever Zatarain <laughs> brand. I'm not going to judge you right now. <laughs> Anywho, so to get into some business, I wanted to ask, so you've, you've seen it all. What are some of the things that you experienced when you first started in construction to what you experience now as the owner of a construction business, a, a general contractor? What are your, what are things that you miss about not owning a business? And what are the things that you love about owning a business in right, that I'll answer the second, the second side of that question because the first one it, it's a drastic difference um because when i first started it was very not pc and so people didn't mind hurting your feelings which i think we're missing that in the industry a little bit um it's a hard industry and so with tipping around every tiptoeing around everyone's feelings it's uh makes it difficult sometimes um but as far as a business owner owning and not owning i guess what i miss about not owning the business is leaving work at home i mean leaving work at work Work at work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's very easy to shut it off and go home. And it'll be there tomorrow. No big deal. But as the business owner, it never goes away. No. Never goes away. I was not warned about that part. Oh, I had I had warning about that with the working for my mom and stepdad at the bowling alley. I've mentioned this like I feel every episode. Though, but yes, my mom and stepdad <laughs> own a bowling alley. Um, and I worked for them for eight years. And something that was always a goal, I think that we all had was to, you know, 
family is at home, work is at work. I'm an employee when I'm here. I'm not your daughter, right? But it was also hard, like in happy times, wanting to share like family stuff at work. You mm-hmm. want to do that. And it kind of dissolves that boundary, which you don't want to do. But that's something that I learned the hard way. I can't tell you how many times like something from home would carry over to work or going home and talking about work the rest of the night when you have to be there again at open the next day. That's something that working from home, I've tried to establish as well as going when I close the office doors for the night, I close the office doors. But then it's like Katie and I are texting at like 10 o'clock at night. Oh my God, we should do this. Oh my God, we should do that. Like we have to do this. We have to do that. And it's all work anyway. Well, but- that's I'm, I'm envious of that, of that conversation 10 o'clock at night because my mind does that. But without having person, it's I understand why they say it's lonely at the top. It's not that nobody's there with you or anything like yeah. that. It's just lonely because you don't, you can't share those things all the time. Right. right? And not everyone's excited. You know, my wife is supportive of me fully, but she can't get as excited about things that, that I'm excited about. She's not about. in so it like you. She's not sure. in it. She doesn't understand. Right. So if I'm a little envious of that, but I get it. Um, my, oh, I do get some excitement, but most of the time it's worry, you know, worry about this bill or how am I going to pay this vendor or the most important, how am I going to keep all my boys working through the holidays? Right. 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 All those things. It's, 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 you're responsible for a lot of things and it's, uh, it gets overwhelming sometimes. I've, I've noticed with myself that one of the, I guess, triggers, maybe KPIs to say that's so we're talking about business. One of the things that I really pay attention to is if I in casual conversation with random people, if I can notice that I'm running out of things to talk about and it's always business, I'm working too much. Yeah. I'm not living a life where I have other things to work, talk about. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. currently that's where I've been, uh, but I'm trying <laughs> to change that. I'm really trying to change that. But also at the same time, you know, we've talked about it in previous episodes too. It's we're in Q4 now and powering through Q4 is going to set you up for a successful 2024. And that's also something that's hard because you don't want to feel like you're not powering through it, but you also want to have that time to just not worry about it. So it, it's hard to, to establish that boundary, especially coming into the end of the year. Yeah, I'm a little tempted. I'm somewhat tempted uh, today. Matter of fact, I thought about it. It's like, man, you know, I've got a lot of things going on in the holidays and November and we don't have a lot of, our books aren't full for the next two months. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have Christmas and I've got uh, annual trip that I make, guys trip thing that I do mm-hmm. in December. So I'm like, you know, I could just kind of float through the, the last two months. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, you're looking at, oh man, I really need to push hard these mm-hmm. last two months. So the first quarter is productive. Right, right. So you don't feel like you don't feel like you're starting over. Correct. Like you want to have that momentum yeah. going into the into the new year. So yeah. yeah. And though it was funny, Emma, like you had mentioned, like that balance of trying not to like when you can shut it off we actually just talked about it earlier on a call with the team that um you you're always the last person to, to take care of when you get it it's easy it's so easy to get into that rut of everyone's needs are more important than your own so mm-hmm. that's when you're not going to the gym or you're not eating healthy and then because we're trying to we're on a program the three of us are on a program that we're trying to stick to in the mornings and it would be real easy with the type of work that we do just just like lay in bed longer and roll over like emma said you just roll over and grab your laptop and that that's i used to get in that really bad habit where my laptop was next to my bed so i would work until 11 or 12 o'clock at night and then i'm up at still at you know 5 30 or 6 i wasn't getting any kind of sleep so just being able to juggle that and focus on like taking care of yourself is just as important as making sure everybody else is taken care of in the organization so i will say i can't speak for everyone it's just my current experience Mm -hmm. is that because we're such an infant phase in the company i feel like one year in fully that uh this takes precedent over everything that's that's the way my mindset is right now yeah everything is sacrificed for this you know and i i'm hoping because because you hear that a lot just with all the successful people in the early days you have to grind you have to do these things you have to sacrifice everything for this and become obsessed and and it's very easy to do that but to your point at what cost is it and even me having this conversation now i understand it but i know what i'm going to do tomorrow i'm just going to do the same thing because it needs to get done right right um i don't i don't know what the timeline is you know is it 
three years? Is it five years where you can back away and kind of run the business the way you're meant to run the business from 30,000? There's, there's no specific, in my opinion, there's no specific time frame of when you're allowed to do that. It just depends on if you get the right people in place for it, mm -hmm. you know, where you can, you can have that trust. Cause I was that person for my mom and stepdad at the bowling alley. They did, I can't, I think three or no, they did more than that. They did years of working open to close seven days a week. And when I was able to, to step in place, let's see, I was probably six years of a lot of that. And they had a few people that would come in and step in place. They could be at home or go to, you know, kids events and, and be present with family, but they would be disappointed in that person because they, they'd stress even more. They'd leave the, the business for a day to take a day to do what they needed to do. They'd come back and something would be wrong. And then finally they had, had moved me over from just being the little snack bar girl to the front desk <laughs> and running things and closing so that they could go home and, and actually sleep and not have to work 12 hour days. It just made it easier. So had they moved me to that position sooner, they would have been able to do that sooner. But mm -hmm. I was also, I think I worked there from age 15 to to 23. So yeah, it's hard to trust people. And, and when I say that, like I have people in place that as people, I trust them. Yeah. But we're inside my business. It's, it's just different. It's well, what's I your can't baby? Trust them. What's that? It's your baby. It is my baby. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess it's not I'm gonna get in trouble for this one, but I'm going to equate it similar to like a new mother with her baby, right? It's, you don't, you're not sending it out to, not anybody's going to be able to babysit that so you can go have a night out husband. Right. right? right. It, it, it's the baby. Like, no. So uh, <laughs> I trust these people. However, it's hard for me to fully let go. Now, some of that's my ego and some of that's just right. control, correct? Right? But at the same time, if things don't get done, I guess if my expectations of the timeline isn't met, then it's wrong. And so now I'm stressing out about it. It's not getting done. Or if it's actually wrong, so then mm. there's no trust there. Right. Uh, and you, FYI, you can probably edit this out. I'm just going <laughs> to side note it. But I just hired another person today for accounting because I couldn't trust the accounting. So you have to do these things. Uh, there's a lot of shifting going on. But anyway, and, and hopefully I can start trusting the reports and all those things that are coming through. Mm, right. Because if you can't trust the numbers yep. that you're seeing, then what can you trust? Now, if you can't trust the, the reports that are coming in from the money, then you can't trust anything. And my, right, that's right. the way I'm looking at it. Nothing's right. Right. Yep. No, you can only make decisions based on the data that you're provided with right. or the data or the data that you can put together. And that's why you have see a lot of business owners that in their first year, they still end up being the only guy doing everything because there's not certain things in place that someone else could manage or somebody else could watch. So then they have their hands and everything. But, but we're working on that. We're working on that together. There have been a lot. Yeah. I mean, as far as all of the processes and things that you've put in place, like there's a lot. It's to the point now where you've got a couple key really good people on the team that can give you good feedback, good feedback that you can say, hey, we could improve this process or we could we need to change it based on how we're actually doing it from day to day like it's not quite right and you trust their judgment because they're they're doing it so then that way you're not bearing all of that you know all of that burden but when it comes down to it you want to be able to make those when it comes to trust or trust based on output right that you want it to either be a process it's it's either a process issue or it's a people issue and the more that you can eliminate you know cr you know create that process of elimination that it's not a process or a systems issue we have all of that it's do we have people that can execute it and follow it so but your the progress that you've made on that front just in your first year has been amazing because a lot of people don't even think about that until hey we survived our first year <laughs> so now what can we put in place so and so i mean being on the forefront of that is positioning you further along than most people a year in yeah, I've, I've got some feedback on that where some negative feedback on the way that I've approached the business. Mm -hmm. And in that negative feedback has been similar to what you just talked about. How are you building the foundation first? Like you get sales first, sales is revenue, 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 right? Get money in your pocket. Then you figure this stuff out. And I just haven't approached it like that. Well, you know, you've been here for a while. Yep. We've approached it from we're building the foundation first. Yes, I'm not doing $10 million. But it, to my point, if we wait till we're doing five, six, $10 million to start doing these processes, how much money are we going to lose? Right. The profit time period. tank. Yep. How many employees are we going to lose? 
ones, good ones, because we didn't have things in place. Mm -hmm. So I'm just suffering through it. And I know it's going to pay off. I'm, there's, I'm, I'm confident in that. It's all going to pay off. It just um, makes it progress a little slower is all it does. Sure, that's but, right. I mean, from a revenue production standpoint, all it does is just make the revenue production a little bit slower. But, but when it speeds up, you're going to be in a way better position for all of that revenue to be profitable. So, Correct. I mean, there's, there's plenty of roofing company owners who, you know, maybe they've not, ex that I've met that they've been at like a three, three to $5 million range, like teetering back and forth for several years but they're like all i i focus on my profitability so you know do i want to sell 10 million dollars at 18 percent profit or do i want to sell you know five million dollars at 40 percent profit so it's all perspective right so right. as long as you're maintaining your profitability because you're catching all of these things along the way then you have a safety net in place to to amplify so it's just a different way of doing it you know doing things as as opposed to some someone might look at it and say that it's wrong but that's just if they want to live in the chaos and the mess they can live in the chaos and the mess but right. you ca you came from a different world right you said you know coming yeah. from commercial construction they don't mess around <laughs> they do so. not they do not <laughs> and you know it, it, it kind of slipping back into the trust thing it's you know when, when i talk about trust with employees it's not that they're i want them to do every trusting that they do everything correct it's it's trusting that they have good intentions behind every decision they make right mm -hmm. Right. Because similar, my daughters or my son, it's not I don't expect them to do everything right. And you have to give them the freedom to kind of fail. Right. Sure. Now, obviously, you're dealing with profit margin, so I don't want you to fail, <laughs> but you have to give them that. They have to learn. And yeah. if I'm just dad and I, I catch myself doing this sometimes. I'm dad and I'm constantly coaching them up. Hey, don't do that. Do this way. Do this way. Do this way. Even inside the business and at home. And, and sometimes I just have to be quiet. Just let it happen. And mm. that that to me is the, one of the most difficult things. Um, and that that's how I develop trust with them. I have to give them the opportunity to provide. Right. Right. Improve, right? Which is also a very scary thing to do when you think about it. It's it's yeah. hard scary. to give that opportunity. You have to give that opportunity, but it's hard to give that opportunity. It is, but it's the only way that I'm going to be able to step away from certain positions in the company. Right. Right. I, and I know that, and I'm trying to do that. It's, it's difficult sometimes, but, but on the same hand with accounting, accounting is not my strong suit. It's not supposed to be. <laughs> it's not, but as a business owner, I have to educate myself and I'm currently educating myself to understand finances and things like that. It's important. We have to know our numbers. However, it's not my strong suit. So I have to trust the person that I hire to do that kind of from start. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm just checking numbers and I, mean, I can only follow behind them as much as I can because I can't tell them how to do the job because I don't right. necessarily know how to do the job. Right. Um, so there's a the trust level there that just has to be there. But I would be a naive, I guess, if that's the right word, business owner, if I just said, hey, do my accounting and then tell me how much money I'm making tomorrow. Right. I, I can't. That's not to me. That's not a business owner. It's just somebody no. as a salesman trying to make some money. Right. 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 Yep. That's a. Uh... That's, I mean, that's the right attitude to have. Like, you got to know enough to be able to have like an agreement with somebody. Like, what are, what are their expectations? What are your expectations? And there's a, you know, if, even if you're not an expert at something, there's a few key things to look at to say, hey, I, I may not know everything there is, but I know that I need to ask a question. Like, I know something's not quite right. Something's not quite dry, jiving. So it's going to at least ignite a conversation, right? So to where you could potentially work through solving a problem. Uh, one thing kind of all in the same topic, but one question I don't think I've ever asked you coming from the commercial construction space and getting into storm restoration when you did what was the biggest like culture shock moment that you had getting into <laughs> the storm restoration industry man <laughs> roofers are pirates they, they can be highly sure. intelligent pirates <laughs> like i was it was literally culture shock and I walked in and I started meeting some some guys, some pretty, pretty big name roofers in the industry, right? Uh, storm chasers. They're they all storm chasers that I'd met. I worked with mm -hmm. for a few years and uh, I was just blown away at the, I don't really know how to say this, but some of them were very crude, I guess is why I call them pirates. And they're just yeah. <laughs> wild and everything, you know, gunslinging and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to money and marketing, it was, they were geniuses. Mm -hmm. Like I've watched guys that had three teeth come into an office and spit out numbers and write out a contract and say this is our profit margin this is what we're doing this is every nickel's counted for i'm like man how did, how did you do that right yeah. um and then when i started going to some of the conferences i recognized that no one markets better than 
a roofer. And I mean, I've been in the industry my entire career. So I've seen, I've worked for $100 million uh, general contractors, building hospitals and different things. Like I've been around big stuff and no one has ever marketed the way that I saw small roofing companies market. Yep. Let alone the big companies or the guys that consider themselves roofing owners that are really just really good marketers, right? One of the so biggest that's, big that's companies the biggest I was in was like that. I was going to say one of the roofing, one of the bigger roofing companies that I was a part of as an employee, we were always told we're just a sales and marketing organization that happens to do roofing. So I everything see that was in, about that. Yeah. I see that in the storm chasing industry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm starting to separate the two. And yeah, I see a clear divide between actual roofers as tradesmen, even business owners that own real roofing companies that are tradesmen and, mm -hmm. and companies that storm chase. Yep. Because they are just marketers and they're extremely good at it because mm -hmm. they have to come into an area and become known as the the number one roofing company in the matter of a few weeks. Yeah, like 30 days. Like 30, 30 days. days. Yeah. Like if, so, if you pack up your whole organization and you go chase a hurricane or you chase a, a hailstorm, like you have 30 days to cash flow or it's not or it's a failure. Like if you're not embedded, you know, that's and I think things are starting to change a little bit. Like the dynamics that I see in just from the time time that I got into the roofing industry where everything was still really heavily door to door, you were lucky if roofing companies had websites. SEO was this uh, like um, this thing that was just like expensive and no one really understood and everyone's trying to sell it to you, but you like you're trying to get sold by like the yellow pages and the newspaper. Like those are the type of companies that were trying to sell marketing services to roofing companies. And it was the importance of the brand and and the things that were the, you know, everything that had to be very consistent. And what we understood as marketing at the time was are all of the shirts, you know, do all of the shirts match with the door hangers, with the with the business cards and all are all of the trucks wrapped? Do we have yard signs and that was their focus do you get referrals are you talking to your neighbors are you networking so i mean all of that sales and marketing that's still activity that a lot of companies do and it's but it's just like one level right where now you're seeing a lot more especially established brick and mortar businesses that are roofing companies where their focus is more digital they don't they didn't completely abandon everything that's over here they might have used like the most the 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 best performing aspects of it but you just see this change where i mean i know they still exist but i don't i don't really interact with as many storm chasers as i used to it's almost like they try to keep it a secret if they do it like that's something that i kind of see out there where you might have two or three guys that hey i'm just going to partner with a company who's already in a southern state and work there during the winter as opposed to somebody trying to go open an office anymore so and i don't know if i don't know if you see that but that's kind of some of the stuff that i've seen over the last couple of years where you don't you don't notice it as like hey this company just popped up in this city and they have 30 sales reps on the ground These, there are still some that do it but i just don't see it as much as i used to you know 10 years ago yeah they they still do it with areas like where i'm at in, in louisiana south louisiana specifically we're used to storm chasers mm -hmm. so they have to hide um as a community we are because we get i mean hurricanes every right. year right so and which brings me to a whole other topic about regulation i think would help with a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. um and though it's not a popular topic among storm chasers but, <laughs> it depends on what state you're in <laughs> yeah right um but, i mean you look at florida i mean it's very hard to just pop up out of nowhere in in florida there's too much regulation around. Yeah. You know, it is still difficult once you get those uh, get those certifications and licenses and all the things in place. It's still difficult to roof there. Mm -hmm. You know, so and and I say that because with the repairs that we're doing, just the repair department, storm chasers are. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad with some of the stuff that we were doing. Now, some companies that we're doing things for did things correctly and it's just it's warranty work. No big deal. But there's some that, you know, they came from Alabama somewhere, a specific job that this company come from Alabama. And it was, mm -hmm. I can't believe they were even let in, in the neighborhood. It was so bad. So, I mean, those things, that's where regulation would come in, but I don't know. <laughs> also train I don't know. I, I mean, being that I worked primarily in an unlike, which, which is weird. I live in a licensed state. I'm sitting right now in a licensed state. The river is right here. If I cross that river, <laughs> you know, a two two minute drive right across the bridge, um, you're in an unlicensed state. And so just that struggle of people being able to cross the river and do work. But I've got I've I've seen the perspective from both sides. And long term, I mean, the right regulation and licensing is 
better for everybody. You know, obviously some of the politicians in this particular state who happen to also own construction companies don't want to hear that, but, and all the home builders and whatnot, but it, it ends up being, it ends up being better for everybody. It's better for the consumer. Yeah, for sure. Like top, especially a better for the consumer. Because my argument is why is roofing not a specialty trade? I don't know. I mean, I've met guys that could just throw a truck together and go do plumbing, but that's yeah. a specialty trade. Mm -hmm. To me, this, this is the first line of defense. Why is it not? I don't understand. So currently I'm working with a few people here. It's slow, obviously, because of the politics, but there's there's a few of us here that are working and we're we're stepping in the in down that path of regulation and trying to get something around because we don't we don't need permitting here for roofing. Yeah. Which I don't understand that. To me, you yeah. should get a permit so we know it's put on right. Um, right now we do have the there's a very strong push for fortified here mm -hmm. and i am all for that not only because of opportunity but mainly because it's it's gonna force some kind of regulation it's gonna for it's better right. for the consumer they get a better product because there's inspection periods and things like that well that and with where you're located so i mean some people may not realize and i didn't at the time I didn't realize I didn't realize how far south Baton Rouge is and how close really you are to into New Orleans and everybody thinks of New Orleans when you hear of things like Hurricane Katrina but the hurricane now I can't remember which hurricane it was that went through like Lake Charles and That's um, Laura. that was Laura so I mean just how close you guys are to where you have to have some of those hurricane mitigation requirements and and I I get that you're further inland it's not like you know like in Florida where there's like certifications and forms they have to fill out did you install this a certain way but you get hit by this you get hit by the same storms so like you hurricanes can clear a path or cause damage quite a few miles in you know inland well, and I'm I'm three hours from the coast yeah and we still get category four hurricanes here mm -hmm. so lake charles is it's kind of it's close to the coast i guess but they it was a category four when laura went through there mm -hmm. so we're getting very strong hurricanes yeah they come this far in right and they're 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 very strong I'd say for another hour north of you yeah. before they really start dying down. So you touched on the fortified roofing system. I know that that's something that's not available. It's not in every single part of the country, and but and not everybody qualifies for it. So you have to go through quite a bit of a qualification process to make sure that you're doing things the right way. So explain to the listeners what that, you know, what that program entails. Well, it's it's a program of standards, building standards. They're, uh, it's not code enforcement. It's just a building standard presented by IBHS, which which is the insurance companies, mm -hmm. right? And so they put this in place. And the, the easiest way that I can explain it is it's the Miami-Dade code. It's the exact building standard that happens in Florida. And they're implementing it here. I think they, they've been along the Gulf Coast, but it's been sporadic. I know Alabama, Mobile specifically, had a strong push there. So they, they, they brought it in here. And recently they have implemented, they've partnered with the state. And there's a large grant, a fortified grant, that the customers can can qualify for and they get up to a certain amount of money towards their fortified system um, if they need a new roof. Uh, we still only recommend it to customers that need a new roof. Yeah. Because we've had some call say, I want fortified roofing. Well, you have to rip everything off to do it. Yeah. And so when they, typically they, they don't go down that road. But um, yeah, it's just a building standard and it's inspected by both. We have standards as a contractor on our not only our installation, but our inspection process. And then there's also a uh, evaluator that is sent or certified through uh, IBHS to do a third party inspection for IBHS during that process. And then everything gets sent in and uh, you get your certification. Not many. Uh, how many contractors or roofing contractors in general are like percentage wise? Are part of the fortified program i haven't checked in a little while since the grant program it's obviously went up people rushed to get their certifications mm -hmm. but um i'm gonna say 20 maybe 20 percent which is a low number considering the amount of roofing companies we have in the state yeah no kidding right yeah um you have to get as a contractor we have to have two separate certifications for ibhs um in order to be a, a contractor for that specific grant um but only one is needed if you're just doing a standard four to five roof okay well since we work with you <laughs> we know what services you provide yeah i was gonna ask what service is your favorite to provide what is your most popular that you provide um unfortunately my most popular is repairs mm. which is 
a little bit of a sore subject for me for our peer group, our roofing peer group in the community. Yeah. Uh, thinking about storm chasers and they took all the work and all this kind of stuff that goes on. But yeah, repairs, it's this the most popular. Um, my favorite is the commercial roofing side. I love it, but also I'm a little biased because that's been my career for the last 15, 17 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm just I'm very comfortable in that environment. And it's it's just, I don't know, it's, it's a sense of accomplishment, I guess, on the commercial side, because typically what we're going after now, and it's been the most exciting buzz around the office, is the new construction commercial retail business that we're going after. And uh, we're building out an estimating department, and which is speeding up, it's gaining momentum very quickly. And so that's, it's just been very exciting to, to see it. And I, mean, I was on one today that they're we're waiting on some few things, but we're geared up, ready to put on a Suprema product. And it's it's su super exciting, right? Yeah. <laughs> New construction Suprema. I mean, it's it's and learning also there's processes because once you go into the commercial and you're dealing with architects and engineers, there's mm -hmm. a whole new world out there that uh, you know your typical I'd say storm chasing commercial guy just doesn't get into because he doesn't right. need to right. So it's just a whole new world of uh, of eyes looking at you and documents and just all the stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. That make that make me so nervous. So, like you have the you have a. A, a company that you've never heard of before and most people don't see it i think maybe I, it makes me more nervous knowing some of the inner workings of some of the companies where it's like there's one dude in this entire organization that knows anything about commercial roofing and they're out there like inspecting a two or three million dollar project that would make yeah. that would, if some of the property owners knew it's like you have one guy and maybe he only knows it enough to like talk product and damage like not even necessarily like all the technical aspects like that would that would make me an, a, just an absolute nervous wreck. But well, there's a lot of companies out there that are like that. There is. Unfortunately, what I've seen in the storm business, dealing with storm commercial guys, mm -hmm. is everybody wants that big ticket. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to get in and talk to someone fairly easy. And if you're a good salesman, you can talk your way into anything. And most of the people that you encounter, even on the commercial side, during a hurricane, and which has my really been my only real experience, is two major hurricanes. Most people, they just want someone to handle their insurance. They don't care. Put the roof on it. Right. right? And so it's easy to get in the door. And then as a, as a commercial salesperson, if you can do that and you get that insurance paperwork, you just sold the job. And then you have the one person, the one guy that knows what he's doing. He's responsible for getting everything put together, which is unfortunate for him. But there, I've seen it. There's quite a few quote unquote commercial salesmen that really they're just taking orders during a hurricane. They're, they're really not. They have no idea. Yeah. Yelp. That's terrifying. Yeah. So out of a, uh, like Emma had asked about your favorite service, um, but like kind of thinking about next year with all of this, all of the planning that we've been doing, all of the things that we have laid out, um, the direction that you want to go, casting the vision, what, what gets you most excited, like looking forward to next year? <laughs> Emma's going to love this one. I am, I'm truly excited about the PR aspect of next year. I really am. <laughs> because um, I'm not excited about all the activities that it was making me do, right? Signing me up to do, but I'm I'm starting to network some as a business owner and not as a salesman, mm -hmm. and it's it's very exciting to me. And I'm starting to get a little buzz. I'm excited about next year because I'm what I'm really chasing as a personal goal is, and this is kind of stroking my own ego, right? Is really just being known in the community as a legitimate company in a legitimate source uh service provider it, it gives case. you more exposure to be transparent right yes. right yeah that's the thing i am getting so excited like putting all this stuff together and and building this campaign basically of you know getting that exposure especially with relevant people you know the goal and i think would be best for you is not getting you in front of you don't have to be in front of the whole country but you want to be in front of the people that you're servicing right Correct. And it's not necessarily to make sales, but it's to be that trusted source in the community. And I think that's what's like the most exciting part about it is that you, mm -hmm. you're speaking to the the people that it'll impact the most. Right. So um, yeah, and it's been exciting because I've spent. So I looked at things differently. I've always wanted to own my own business, but I always thought that I needed to learn how to do the work first. That's absolutely incorrect. Yeah. Right? I've worked for people that had no idea how to do the work. They just understood how to run a business. So I'm having to learn an entirely new skill. But what I've always been chasing 
more knowledge, more knowledge. I need to be good enough, right? I need to be good enough. I need to be smarter. I need to be able to do all these things. But what I've realized is here in the last, I don't know, two months, maybe it's hit me that I've got something to offer to the community here because yeah. of the 30 years in the construction industry and not behind a desk trying to run a business. And now that I'm on that side, and I'm learning the skill and I'm learning all these new things. I consider myself now a little more well-rounded and um, I don't think it's egotistical to say that, right? Yeah. It's just a no. fact. It's what it is. And um, so I have something to offer. And so that's why I'm currently involved in a couple of different associations in the city and things like that. And uh, because we you know, you guys know my vision and all that kind of stuff for the company and right. what I'm trying to do for my employees. But really, some of these new business owners or, or entrepreneurs, let's just say that, they need a little help. Mm -hmm. Right. And while there's so many resources out there, what they don't have is someone kind of advocating for them. You know, because uh, most of the time it's it's what I one of the biggest lessons I've learned in business is it's cutthroat, man. It's, it's sharks out here. And yeah. so nobody's really trying to help you give you a leg up, especially in the same industry. It's not going to do that. Yeah. Right. Not without something in their pocket in some yeah. form or fashion. Absolutely. I think um, another thing that, that gets me excited about building this PR campaign is, is the fact that I don't see other people in the industry. You know, some people might get on a podcast here or have a news article here. I mean, hell, we've got Mark Wrights. I'll shout out Mark. <laughs> He's gotten in the news a couple of times, you know, a couple of things like that, but it wasn't ever any PR campaign, right? It wasn't anybody actively searching out, getting him in the news and getting him on newspapers and, and on the internet and all that fun stuff. I think that's something that's different that we're able to provide is like actually going here. This is all the stuff that we want published about you, right? Because it's not only about getting you in the paper, it's about getting all the right information, getting all the trustworthy information into the paper um, or, you know, on a podcast or on a blog or whatever it may be in a news article. And I, I just don't know of many roofers that are doing anything outside of their normal day to day and marketing, right? Or, or so-and-so's events, right? Like, Anybody yeah. hosting events? Yeah. Um, so events or uh, influencers? What's that? Is events or influencers or everything so national? Right. And it's that's the thing with it's cool to do that if you're the guy hosting the event, right? You want all these people coming sure. here because it's general, it's relevant. But you're not looking to reach people in freaking yeah. I don't know New York. Like, no, that's not your yeah. people. That's not who you're resonating with, or not who's resonating with you. I mean, what are you going to do for somebody that lives in New York? Right. Sure. right. And I and I understand some of the mindset behind it. You have to get out there and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, so I understand it. Right. But I also see what happens a lot, especially in the roofing industry. And you guys all know what I'm talking about. Is most of the time the the marketing or the influencing is just to other roofers. Right. And roofers mm -hmm. aren't buying from me. Right. <laughs> right. So like, what exactly. am I doing? I don't understand. <laughs> right. Um, now. If you have a business that roofers are buying from you, like, okay, I get it. Right? Yeah. I understand. But no. And, and, and so I guess maybe during this PR campaign of 2000, the great PR campaign of <laughs> 2024, right? That's what we're going to call it. Um, at some point, will we be on some bigger podcast to get a little more national? Maybe I don't know, but I'm not going to turn down the opportunity. But right. To your point, that's not the goal. Right. right. At, the, at that point, right. you've you've done the due diligence for your your people. Sure. You know, at that point, if you've gotten to that stage, which I hope we do. Right. That'd be fantastic. You're speaking to more than just your customers at that point, which actually leads me to my last question that I have, because we're we're at that hour mark. Um, what advice do you have for roofers, people, whoever, who have been in your shoes, who have started since they were 15 and have gone, you know, this far and worn all different hats in the industry and, or, or those who are aspiring to be, to, to own a roofing company, what have you learned and that can, you can tell them so they don't have to live through it like a mistake or something? Well, start now. Yeah. If you want to be an entrepreneur, start right now. Because I have a little bit of regret in that I feel like I may have wasted years as a, an entrepreneur. I could have learned how to run a business way earlier when I had a lot more energy, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, like pick one and start. If you want to be in the trades, that's great. We need tradesmen. And you could maybe run a small business or something at one point, but you can't do both at the same time. Right. You're going to have to pick one. And I'm going to always say, start your business now. Preach. Yep. Yep. 
do it. (laughs) Anyway, for those of you listening, if you would like to hear a topic, if you need advice, if you just want to chat, you could reach out to us on Instagram at F underscore underscore K or pod, or you could always email me at Emma at 99 creatives or Katie, Katie at 99 creatives. And then Don, let us let the listeners know where they can find you. If they ever want to chit chat. They can find me. They can find me everywhere. (laughs) Uh, 99 creatives has put me on the map. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, Instagram at roofing stalwart. Yeah. It's stalwart roofing, right? We made that change stalwart roofing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we're on all this stuff. Now we don't, I'm not Twitter or any of that Snapchat stuff. I'm not doing all that, but, uh, <laughs> just the, just Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. Thanks to Miss Katie. Um, I'm on there personally. So that's probably the best place if you want to reach me. Perfect. Yeah. I, my LinkedIn was pathetic before we started this visit. It's still, it's kind of pathetic. Not going to lie. LinkedIn's not my favorite. And, and Katie, I will shame you all for Katie it. Katie has scolded me for months <laughs> because of this. So I know, I know the feeling. Um, but yeah, for those of you listening, um, give John a shout out if you have any questions and don't forget to do the damn thing. Okay. Bye. All right. Adios. Thank you.